Okay, so um, let's uh, begin again. Uh, so let's start off with a, um, a quote. This is by Isaac Walton, the fellow who wrote The Complete Angler, which is considered like one of the first major books published on fishing and angling. And he said of fly fishing, it's the contemplative man's recreation, which I, I tend to agree with. I, I find it very uh, relaxing and easygoing. Uh, so a few, I'll go through uh, the types of fishing. You probably already know this kind of stuff, but I'll just quickly uh, skim through it just for those who don't. Uh, three main types of fishing, of course, and that's fishing for freshwater fish that aren't considered food, such as tench, bream, rod, etc. Uh, sea fishing, which I think is pretty self-explanatory, and game fishing, and that's freshwater fish that are considered good to eat, such as salmon, trout, char, etc. Uh, carp doesn't obey the rules. Uh, carp can be... Um, game fish and coarse fish at the same time because uh, carp are delicious. So that's the one that that's the odd one out. Uh, the methods of fishing which are used uh, interchangeably between uh, coarse game and sea fishing are there's obviously bait fishing which is worms, maddock, maggots etc. Lure fishing which is also known as spooning or spinning and the two pictures there are of a spoon and a spinner. The spoon is so called because it's shaped like a spoon, and the spinner because the uh, oval bit spins fast in the water uh, when you pull pull it through the water, which uh, attracts fish's attention. And of course, fly fishing, and fly fishing isn't just for game fish; it's also very popular in sea fishing and for certain types of coarse fishing, uh, in particular uh, carp. So you kind of wonder if carp is more of a game fish than a coarse fish, but there you go. <laughs> Uh, fly fishing is using a small artificial lure designed to look like a fish's natural food, cast out using a special weighted line to allow the angler to present the fly to the fish in a way that looks natural. Um, like I said earlier, it's not just for game fishing, it's also using coarse and sea fishing. Uh, on the bottom left, that's a picture of a fly known as a gold ribbed hare's ear. And it's made of, the body is made of a uh, hair hair mask fa fabric. I'll show you what a hair's mask is later on. It's uh, not for the squeamish. Uh, the tail is feathers and it's designed to simulate the nymph stage of a mayfly, which is on the right. So the fly on the left is designed to imitate the fly on the right. Uh, you kind of wonder why fish would happily accept that imitation. Uh, it's more because they don't have the most clear vision, but what they do have is an incredible uh, vision for movement and disturbance. So uh, they'll happily so accept the fly that it isn't perfect so long as it appears where it's supposed to be and there's no extraneous movement or disturbance on the water. Uh, a little bit on the fly life cycle. This is the three main stages that fishermen are interested in. Uh, this, is, this is the midge fly. So that goes through the nymph stage, the emerger stage and the adult stage. So not in this picture is the egg stage. So uh, when flies uh, are adults and they're flying about above the river, they're mating and the female fly will go down to the water, uh, lay the eggs, and they'll sink to the bottom and uh, into the gravel or the mud at the bottom. And they'll stay there for anything up to a couple of years until they're ready to emer uh, hatch. And when they hatch, they come out as a nymph. On, that's the... A figure on the left and they get up to the surface and as soon as they reach the surface they shed their skin, uh, hard outer shell skin and their wings emerge from underneath what's kind of like a cocoon and for about five minutes they sit on the, the surface of the water trying to dry out their bodies and their wings and when that dry and when that happens they become a fully fledged adult fly and they fly off and mate and do their thing and after they've mated uh, the the male fly dies and the female fly lay, lays the eggs and she dies too. Uh, in all three stages, they're very uh, fish, uh, game fish love eating these. Uh, the nymph stage as it rises up through the water and the emerger stage when it's stuck in the water surface and the adult stage, it's, they're all food to fish. And uh, to give you an example of what the artificial flies that look like these are, so we have the nymph on the left, and it's simply a, a load of black thread wrapped around a hook with a little bit, a little bit more at the head for the forex, 
painted in varnish. The merger is silicone tubing wrapped around the body with a type of feather known as coldy canard, which is uh, comes from a certain breed of duck that's bred in France, and it naturally floats. So that's uh, why they use it for emer- uh, these kind of flies. And as the emerger sits in the water, it'll sit upright with the fibers sticking above the surface of the water, looking like wings that are being dried out. And the adult fly is made using a cocktail feather strands and the body is made of seals fur dubbing, which isn't really seals fur. This day and age, we use uh, artificial seals fur substitute because um, it's nicer. So yeah, that's the, so those are the simulations of the, of uh, those. Uh, so uh, three types of artificial fly. There's the dry flies, which are designed to simulate adult flies flying about above the water. Um, wet flies are the emer- simulate emergers, nymphs, and they are fished in the water surface or under the surface of the water. And you've got lures, which are not to be confused with the metal lures I talked about earlier. These are, like I say, big old gaudy things, and they're used mainly for rainbow trout. Uh, there's also lures that are designed to simulate little fish such as minnows. Um, so I'll give you an example. Uh, on the top left, we have a fly called the Red Adams, which is a classic dry fly that simulates several fly, uh, spe- uh, species of flies such as mayflies, uh, crane flies, and another one which I've forgotten. On the right is a wet fly called the Black and Silver, which is... Uh, more of an agitation pattern. You'd fish that under the water and try and agitate the fish into attacking or confusing it. You know, and wet flies are fished a bit differently to dry fly, uh, other types of flies in that you're trying to stimulate a response that's not necessarily for food. The bottom right, sorry, the bottom left is a fly called the booby. Uh, and it's it's an ugly thing, as you can see. Uh, the eyes are made of polystyrene. The body is made of a type of tinsel called fritz. And the tail fellers are from a turkey, and it's marabou fe- feathers. Uh, this is a fly, and flies that are similar sort of color scheme and size are designed for rainbow trout. Rainbow trout are not picky eaters. They will eat anything. Um, and you, you would never catch a salmon or brown trout on something like that. And on the right is a streamer, which is also a type of lure. Uh, and that's just designed to simulate minnows or other uh, small fishes that you might find in a river or a lake. Um, yeah, so uh, most fishermen would stick to uh, nymphs and uh, dry flies usually uh, on most rivers in the UK and Ireland, although there's also there's definitely no uh, times for wet flies as well. And if you're fishing for rainbow trout, you'd almost certainly use those gaudy looking things. So a uh, lot of the fish, this is, I've only picked out the four main types. There's loads more such as char and um, perch and the likes, but uh, the brown trout is uh, the first one. Uh, it's a non-migratory fish, uh, lives in both rivers and lakes. And the current UK record is 31 pounds and it's good eating. And it's quite a nice fish to eat. Although typically you're gonna catch fish between one and five pounds in most places. The sea trout is actually the brown trout's ocean-going cousin. It's migratory. Uh, you'll find it in livers, rivers and river-connected lakes in the UK and Ireland. The record is 29 pounds. They live out at sea, but they come upriver to their spawning grounds to fish, sorry, to, to spawn. And as they actually come upstream, they turn brown, like brown trout. And as they go back out to sea again, they turn into that the, those uh, silvery pinky colours again. So it's uh, quite fascinating how that happens. It basically, it's the same species, but they've diverged and they behave differently. So uh, the, it affects their colourings. Um, sea trout is highly prized by a lot of fishermen because they're quite hard to catch. Uh, rainbow trout, um, not native to the UK or, or Europe, comes from America. Uh, they have a ferocious appetite. They'll eat anything. They're not picky like brown trout and the uh, salmon. That's why they're so popular stocked fish in the big water company reservoirs like Rutland and Grafham Water. Um, in America, they do live in rivers, but it tends to be the warmer rivers. 
Uh, we don't really have rivers like that in Western Europe, so you only really find them in lakes. Um, current UK record is 34 pounds. If you're fishing uh, rainbow trout in uh, the UK, fishing for rainbow trout in the UK, you are almost certainly fishing for a farmed fish. They don't really breed naturally in the UK. That being said, once they have been bred artificially, they tend to be quite sturdy and can live to quite an old age. Uh, and on the right, we've got salmon, uh, that's migratory. It lives in rivers. It's for fishing for rich people. Uh, I'll, I'll come on to salmon, salmon later. And the current UK record was 64 pounds. Uh, had a stood since 1922. And it was caught by Miss Georgina Ballantyne. And uh, the the other trout, the uh, rainbow trout and brown trout and sea trout records, they are all broken within the last uh, 15 years. But the salmon record still stands. And salmon are very hard to catch, but I'll, I'll come on to that in a bit. Uh, so tactics. Um, so you, uh, unlike uh, other types of fishing where you, ca you catch and hope for the best, uh, fly fishing, you generally try to find a fish and stalk it. Uh, so what you do is you'd arrive at the river's edge or the lake, the edge of the lake, and uh, have a look around you and see if there's any fish under the surface. Uh, the one exception to that is, of course, rainbow trout, because that is very much cast and hope for the best, because rainbow trout are easier to catch. But if you're going for salmon, trout and sea trout, you need to take your time and look at the water and read the water. Uh, you want to see what kind of um, flies are in abundance, um, because the fish generally go after the, f the, the food that's most in abundance at any one point in time. Uh, and so if you present something different, they'll see that as suspicious and reject it. Uh, the time of day matters. So nymphs and uh, uh, the eggs come up from the river's beds, usually in the early hours of daylight. So right now it would be like five, six, seven, when the eggs start to raise up from the river's, the river bed. River bed. Uh, then uh, they'll turn, uh, they'll start to emerge on the surface and then uh, start flying away. And throughout the afternoon, your dry flies will be in abundance flying around the river and come about six or seven once they've all done the deed they'll all start dying and dropping down onto the surface of the water so uh you, you kind of have to know when the local insect life moves from one stage to another uh to sort of know which fly to use um different places have different times so those rules aren't the same everywhere so a lot of local knowledge matters so it's always important to speak to people and know the area you're in uh, weller plays a part in it. Hot days make fish lethargic, particularly in shallower rivers. So they'll seek uh, deeper. Seek, they'll seek. They'll go deeper, seeking cooler water, or maybe look for faster flowing water that's aerated. Uh, so in that case, you have to sort of move around and find those locations. Uh, knowing where the fish hang out is another one. Um, you commonly find it where the river bends one way, at the far bank, at the far point of the bend is a, a place where fish will often congregate, particularly if there's trees or vegetation, because the flies will uh, congregate around trees and bushes and uh, it, it makes the e easier picking for the fish. And also uh, spooning. So if you do catch a fish and you want to confirm what's popular, you, we have a thing called a spoon, which is a long, thin spoon that you stick into the fish's mouth, into their stomach, twist it, uh, pull it out, and pour the contents into a cup of water and you'll see what they've been feeding on. And that that then helps you determine the next fly to cash the cast. It sounds a bit disturbing, and it probably is, but uh, that's what we do. Uh, tactics, so we're talking about the trout's field of vision. They've got a field of vision of about 45 degrees, but the way the water refracts the light, it actually means it's much wider. So in reality, you know, you coming up to the water's edge, you have to stay 10, below 10 degrees. So that means crawling up or hiding behind a tree. Like I say, they don't have an, an eye for sharpness, but they do have an eye for movement and colors that are out of place or things that don't make, you know, just aren't normal to them. So uh, one of the big things about tactics is, is arriving at the river's edge really quietly, crawl down or hidden. Uh, and if you just ploy in, all the fish will dis disappear. Um, okay. Uh, so generally fish rest facing upstream. Not always the case, but this is the most basic 
way of thinking about fly fishing. Yeah, I've misspelled that. Sorry about that. The anger, the angler, uh, you, you, you cautiously approach from behind. So you've got the fish pointing that way. So you come in behind them. You fly, you cast your fly ahead of them and gently retrieve the line using your fingers. And hopefully as it passes over their field of vision, <clears throat> you're hoping that they'll that, that'll induce a take and they'll take your fly. Uh, as well as having a very wild, wide field of vision, they're very sensitive to vibrations and unusual noises. So um, like even just walking along the riverbank can spook them. So you've got to be very careful in that regard. Uh, landing the catch. So once you once the fish takes the fly, you have to strike. And that generally means lifting a rod up as fast as you can and quickly pulling back on the line. Once the hook is, the hook is set, you sort of jet, gradually pull in the, the line using your hands. You don't use your reel. Um, <clears throat> and as, a, as you get towards, the, you, you might occasionally let a bit of line out to help play the fish, and that's just to basically tire it out. So you might let it go out a bit, pull it back in, let it go out a bit. And gradually, uh, well, you bring it in towards your the shore, or if you're in a boat, in the boat, and you use a landing net to bring it in, because if you don't, you'll break your rod or rip the fish's mouth open. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, okay, uh, the tackle, um, basics, and this is the basic stuff you need. Uh, rod, reel, line, leader, which I'll come to in a bit. A landing net, a set of polarizing sunglasses, which help you see under the surface of the water. A hat, uh, partly for style, but also for safety, as you don't want the uh, hook catching you on the head. And a thing called a priest, which is the thing on the bottom right. Uh, so called because it's used for dispatching the fish. So to give it the last rites, uh, you give the fish a sharp blow on the head using the brass bit, and that'll kill them instantly. Um, yeah. So the rod itself, um, they're made in lengths from three foot to 20 foot. Uh, generally, use shorter rods for narrow rivers. Realistically, you wouldn't find anyone using anything under uh, six or seven foot uh, because the the really short rods are for really obscure specialist uh, uses or as gimmicks. And the bigger rods above, say, 10 foot, uh, especially above 15 foot, would be for salmon fishing on big rivers. Um, even if you're on a big river, you've got to take into account the vegetation. So you might have a lot of vegetation that forces you to use a small rod. Um, as a general rule, the bigger the rod, the further you can cast, as simple as that. And... If you're fishing on a lake, uh, typically you'd use a 10 foot rod. Uh, each rod has a line weight rating from one to 15. And you need to match that to your rod. So if you've got a seven weight, seven weight rod, which is the sort of standard uh, weight for lake or lake fishing, you have to use a seven weight line. If you use a line that's too heavy, you could break the rod. And if you use a line that's too light, you won't be able to actually cast it. So it's because it's, it you won't be able to get any power into the cast. Um, okay, the rod made from, nowadays it's all made from carbon fiber or graphite composites, um, uh, and it, it's the best material for fishing rods. There is this weird retro trend emerging of people wanting to use glass fiber rods, and that would have been the kind of rods popular in the 60s and 70s. I don't get it because um, these people are hipsters because glass fiber rods are heavy and they lack precision, so you can't feel a bite transferring through to your hand. So uh, I don't know why people are so into it, but it's it's the new thing. It's like um, vinyl with records. Everyone's sort of like suddenly getting back into vinyl and saying the sound quality is amazing. And you kind of go, is it? Uh, and also split cane rods have always been popular. Um, it's never been a big thing in the last few years, but you'll always find a few people out now and again with uh, split cane rods. And they're they're lovely, but they they take a lot of maintenance. If you, you know if you damage them, they are so expensive to repair. And just buying them in the first place is expensive. Uh, the few companies that still make them are, will charge eight, nine hundred pounds for the most basic model. It's uh, but they are nice. Uh, the real okay, one of the most overhyped products ever made. Uh, in fly fishing, you don't use the reel to play fish. You use your hands. You keep your finger on the bottom of the rod and you pull the line through as you're uh, pulling a fish in. And if you've got too much line dropping on the floor, then you'll turn the reel just to pull up the slack line. But you don't use the reel to play the fish. Unlike spinning and bait fishing, where you've got the, the open-faced reel, where you turn the handle and you adjust the drag to allow the fish to pull out line. 
you don't do that in fly fishing. Tackle manufacturers have gone bonkers, like trying to create these over-engineered drag systems that no one will use. And I, I don't understand it, but I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with a company called the House of Hardy. They are based in Annick in Northumberland, and they have a royal warrant. They supply uh, Prince Charles with all his tackle. And they make this reel called the Fortuna Z. And the, the description is out of this world. If you're planning on picking a fight, it's probably best to pick a Fortuna. And they talk about the drag system generating 30 pounds of stopping power and all this fancy space age material and all. And you look at it and you go, it doesn't look the most complicated thing, really. So what would you pay for that? Um, I'll shock you. This is what it costs. Oh, I was guessing 50 quid, mate. That's cheap. That's cheap. That's what it starts at. And they've got more expensive reels. So look at it. Fish you could buy. To sort of go to the other end. What That there for 30 <laughs> pot, do the job just as well. And you can get cheaper than that. That's just the first one I found. So yeah, fl uh, fly reels are mental, the, pe the money people pay for them. I, I just don't understand it. And there's, comp there's companies in America, Loop and Orvis, and they have reels that go up to $1,500. And I'm just like, you're wasting your money. It's probably all for show, though, really, when you think about it. And you want to see the fishing, the price of fishing rods. So <laughs> anyway, so uh, we've seen the, the fishing reels, fly, uh, looking at fly lines. The fly lines sink at different rates. So not in this picture is floating lines, which sit on the surface. Uh, and like you've got slow, intermediate, intermediate, DI3, DI5, and DI7. Different brand names have different names for that. So intermediate might go to slow sinker, medium sinker, fast sinker. Uh, intermediate lines kind of, they stop wherever they land in the water. So they're weighted a little bit. So if they drop down an inch under the surface, they'll kind of stop there. Whereas the other lines will keep going. And again, this is rela related to how you, the fish are feeding and the temperature of the water, determining how deep you want to go. Realist, if you're fishing rivers, you'll probably almost only use a floating line. If you're fishing lakes, then you need to start thinking about sinking lines. So uh, like if you're fishing the big reservoirs, um, you generally would need to carry a floating line with you and probably a slow sinker as well. And if you're fishing in really cold weather, you might need a fast sinker to get down to the depths because uh, in cold weather, the fish will also, like with hot weather, ex extremely cold, uh, hot weather and extremely cold weather, the fish will go down deeper. Um, so you need, you need a range of lines, but for most people starting out, uh, a floating line is fine and you can then get the extra lines when you need them. And again, the lines can be cheap. You can get like a manufacturer's rejects for five pounds, or you can spend a hundred on some fancy technology made with some super space age polymer. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a hobby that can be very cheap or very expensive. Uh, the line also has a taper and that's the shape of the line. So a level taper is the line's the same thickness the whole way along. You've got a weight forward taper where uh, half the line is level taper, but then the forward section gets thicker slightly and then thinner. And there's the double taper where the line is thickest in the middle and thinner at the ends and the shooting head where it's all the thickness is comp um, uh, concentrated towards the front end of the line. So generally what you would do is a shooting head is used for uh, getting maximum distance. The weight is at the front of the line but you lose accuracy. The weight forward would come after that. So that would get you distance, uh, but be a bit more accurate than the shooting head. The double taper is when you want accurate placement of the fly, but you're willing to sacrifice distance. And the level taper is, no one uses it anymore. I haven't seen a level, a level taper line on sailing years. Uh, if you're starting out, I would say, a weight forward taper is the line to go for because it makes it easy to cast and get a certain degree of accurate placing of the fly. Um, so yes, yeah, one of uh, like you could buy a lot of people will buy every taper, the weight forward, the double, and the shooting, so they've got the options open to them when they fish. You don't need to do that. Uh, weight forward's fine for most people, and then once you get uh, experienced casting, you switch to a double taper for precision. Uh, and this is 
how you set up the, the line using a leader. So the fly line is quite thick, you know, it's about a millimeter, two millimeters thick. So what you do from the, you've braided backing on the fly reel itself to the fly line, and that's just, um, if the fish pulls out the entire fly line, then that'll, you've got a bit of extra line on there. And that's usually just braided nylon. And the fly line connects to um, a tapered leader, which is a piece of nylon that starts off thick and gets thin. At the end, you put in a little loop, which is about two millimeters wide, called a tippet ring. And then you attach your tippet. And the tippet is a piece of straight monofilament. Uh, and it's designed to be sacrificial. So once you've used it a few times, you cut it off and attach a new tippet. So the whole line you know, towards the front gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And it's just so it places nicely on the river. So you get a nice curve as it uh, lands on the water. Um, yeah, it's uh, that's how you set it up. So uh, there's one, two, three, four components of the fly line plus the tippet ring. So that's how you set it up. I'm not really going to too much detail about fly casting because that would be a presentation in itself. Um, I'm sure you've seen people fly cast. Uh, it, it's really hard to teach yourself how to cast uh, fly cast. Uh, when I was a teenager, started fishing, I tried and I failed. And I, I was lucky enough that the place I was fishing, you know, the, the staff there helped me and taught me. Um, it's really, I don't think I've met anyone who's actually managed to teach themselves how to fly cast. You do need that help. Uh, there's dozens of different ca cast types, like for the standard one is <clears throat> the overhead cast, which is straight in, stri straight back, straight forward. Uh, there's a roll cast, which is kind of like where you flip the rod over your shoulder at a 45 degree angle and you induce a loop into the line. And that's used for like when you're casting in areas with lots of trees hanging overhead. And in salmon fishing, you've got spade casting because the lines they use are so long they can't just have the whole line go out behind them. So they have to do this kind of spinny thing to, to sort of like a throughout the line. It's like when planes come in to land and they go into a circular stack. So you're going to have to do that with your line before casting out. Um, and that's using rods like 15, 16, 17 foot long. Uh, but you see, yeah, it's, uh, there's not really a lot I can say about fly casting in a presentation. I'm sure you know it's, it's tricky, but it's also really relaxing once you learn how to do it. It's, uh, it feels really good to cast a line well. Another part of the hobby is fly tying. Um, I can be part of the hobby and you can buy, you can go to the shop and buy all the flies you want. But uh, making your own flies is, uh, you know, uh, adds an extra element to the hobby. Uh, a lot of people do fly tying purely as a hobby by itself. There's a lady called Megan Boyd. Uh, she's considered one of the best fly tires the world has ever known. She never once went fishing. Uh, she also, like, she produced flies for royalty and film stars and you name it. She lived in a a cottage in the Highlands, didn't have electricity, um, but she supplied flies to like, you know, all the top fishermen and all the famous people. And uh, like she sent a gift of a fly to Prince Charles and Princess Diana for their wedding. That, that was the, that's the sort of, that, that's how well regarded she was. Um, but she never went, once went fishing in her life. There's a really good documentary that BBC Four put out called, I think it's called Tickling the Water, which sort of touches on her life. Um, so if you, it's on YouTube. So if you want to check it out, it's worth it's worth uh, looking at because it's a really fascinating documentary uh, about you know, her life and what she did, uh, and the fact that she was able to tie flies with no light <laughs> in a in a, a, a cabin with just a window. So now the materials used, uh, we've got thread, pheasant tail fibers. Sorry, that's fibers. Uh, cocktail fillers, fritz, which is a kind of tinsel, marabou, which is. Um, Turkey fellers, hair's mask, polystyrene, tinsel, nail varnish, and wire, and a load of other stuff. And uh, this give me an idea. This is my kit. This is my main kit. I've actually got several other boxes full of stuff. Uh, as you can see on the left, a hair's mask is literally a hair's face. Uh, so we've got some cock feathers towards the middle, pheasant tail feathers, tinsel. There's all sorts there. Um, you can spend an absolute fortune acquiring um, materials. Uh, the cape, the thing called the cape, which is the uh, hand-shaped thing to the left of the bobbins, sorry, to the right of the bobbins, uh, that's um, basically a patch of skin from a uh, cock pheasant. Um, people pay a fortune for quality ones of those. I, I paid 10 euros for that, but you know, the shop I go to has ones that cost like 400 
because they've been specially bred and taken care of and stuff like that. And but yeah, so yeah, I kind of like tying uh, flies. And also the thing to the left of the box that's a fly tying vase vase. Sorry, fly tying vice for holding your uh, hook in as you tie it. Uh, but yeah, you could spend a severe amount of money buying stuff for all this. And a lot of the time you see it because it looks pretty and you think, oh, I could tie something nice with that and you never use it. So it just, <laughs> it just sort of sits gathering dust because you, you tend to know what flies work well for your local area. So you don't really need to buy the materials to make other types of flies. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll just have a quick... A quick little um, touch on fly fish, salmon fishing. It's more of a rich man's game, as I said. Uh, you, know, you can, it's generally more expensive than trout, trout fishing. Um, you can find places that have licenses permits from like 200 pounds upwards, but they're rare. Um, if you want to fish the junction pool on the River Treed for one day, just for one day, 1500 pounds. That's crazy. And the, the River Moy in Mayo in Ireland, which is one of Ireland's big salmon rivers, uh, you want to fish there for a week, it's €4,700. But only one person at a time can fish. So generally what you do is you buy, you'd buy in as a group and go down like five or six people, but only one of you can fish at a time. So it's the, the I don't understand. That's why I'm not really into salmon fishing because it's it's too expensive and it's you know, the price is no... The gear's more expensive, and it's just a, it's just, it's a strange thing. Now, like I say, there are places where you can fish for salmon cheaper, but they're few and far between. Uh, and also, <clears throat> salmon. Sorry, I didn't drink here. Salmon are really hard to catch. Um, so what happens with salmon is they, when they hatch from their eggs, which are buried in the riverbed, they swim out to sea. They'll be out at sea for a couple of years and then come back in up the river to spawn. Once they come up the river to spawn, <clears throat> they stop eating. That's it. They're never going to eat again. Uh, so you're trying to present a fly to them when they're not interested in eating. So no one really knows for certain why salmon snap and actually take the fly. And the best theory is that it's because the fly is annoying them. The salmon has a one-track mind. They're going up river to spawn. And the last thing they want is little irritations stopping them. So that's the best theory as to why salmon take the fly. Uh, but like I say, they're hard to catch because of that. And say on the, the junction pool of the Tweed, for example, which is a fairly large pool. You no, know, it's a couple of hundred meters in length, uh, ranging from 50 to 100 meters in width. In an average year, you might only catch 60 salmon in there. Uh, so like, the amount of money you spend to catch so few fish seems bizarre. And there's people who have been fishing for salmon for 15, 20 years and have never caught a single salmon. But they go out several times during the season trying, but they never catch uh, because salmon are hard to catch. And also once they spawn, the salmon give up and die. Unlike sea trout, which will go back out to sea and then come back again, they might have several spawning cycles. Salmon do it once. They come in, spawn. The females put the eggs in the gravel and they just die. They give up the ghost and die. So, yeah. So salmon fishing is, I don't get it. But, uh, people enjoy it. So I think maybe it's, I've, I've always had a suspicion it's more for showing off than anything. Uh, I, it's their money. They can spend it whatever way they want. <laughs> so let's have a look at costs. Um, if you want to fish for trout, you can get like a lake trout outfit for as little as 100 pounds. You go into any decent fishing shop, they'll get you a rod, the reel, the line, the leader, um, uh, a couple of flies. Uh, you won't, you'd you probably have to buy the glass, and you probably need to buy sunglasses as well, and maybe a pair of wellies. But you can get the sort of core outfit for as little as 100 pounds. In the UK, you have to have a rod license for any kind of fishing, and that ranges from 30 if you just want to fish for brown trout and coarse fish up to 82 if you want to fish for salmon. Even if you've got a private lake on your own grounds, you still need a rod license, which I think is crazy. In Ireland, you only need the rod license for salmon. Then to actually go out fishing, uh, the, the way most people start is to go to a reservoir and price, prices for that starts at 20 pounds upwards. Uh, Grafham, I looked at this today, Grafham water in um, Anglia, in the Anglian water region, they 
29 points as a day's fishing ticket, and that allows you to take up to eight fish home. And after that, it's catch and release. That's a lot of fish. <laughs> and the you know, uh, rainbows and reservoirs tend to be quite big, so you it'll be at least you no know, free points. So that's a lot of fish to take home. And if you can find a local angling club to join, then you know, range from 10 points upwards to whatever, you know, it could be a couple of hundred. It would be a lot cheaper than salmon fishing. Uh, my local club here in Dublin, which is the Daughter Anglers, which controls the Daughter, the River Daughter, I pay 10 euros a year for brown trout fishing. And that's it. That's the only thing I pay. Uh, got my permit there. Ooh. Daughter Anglers, which I bought from Mutz Nuts Pet Care, uh, which is a lovely name for a shop. <laughs> um, yeah, they're a pet shop and fish and tackle shop all in one. Uh, yeah, so... Um, that's pretty much it. Any uh, any questions? Um, and I hope you know it was a bit quick, uh, but I did rush through a bit. But hope hope you find it uh, informative. Well done. Thank, Thank you very much. much. That's excellent. So, uh, oh, Mark that's, Christopher that's asked about good. competitions. Yes, there's loads of competitions. Um, yeah. Local clubs and uh, will have their own competitions. The big reservoirs run by the water companies, they also hold competitions. My club has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine competitions a year. So they list them on the license. Um, and there's also European championships and world championships. Mm. Um, I think the Czech Republic is the current international champion, champions. Um but yeah, there's a lot of competitions and uh, yeah, loads of those. There weren't very many last year though. But, uh, um, yeah, uh, if you want to get competitive, there's plenty to do. Is that how is that um, a competition actually run? Is it like most fish in a yeah, certain amount of time? Well, the biggest fish, or I oh, sorry, <laughs> one second. Why won't you turn on? <laughs> Why are you flashing blue and red? It's the police. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If he's out, use a hammer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Three questions. Uh, so right. Mark Christopher's got some questions. I'll wait until uh, mm. Robert sorts himself out. <laughs> I can hear you now, sorry. You can. Yeah, that my, my, my speakers had switched themselves off. Ali was asking oh. how the questions, are, uh, sorry, how the competitions are judged. Is it the most fish or the biggest fish? or the... Depends on the competition. Some will be the total weight of fish caught. So if you catch 10 one-point fishes, you'll get 10 points. Uh, some will have the number of fish caught. Um, and that's more the case in rivers or lakes where the fish are generally small. So the, it's quantity over quality. Uh, and then there's also multipliers sometimes brought in. So they might say, you know, you get the total bag weight, but if you get fish, individual fish above a certain weight, then that will multiply the points you get. Mm -hmm. So um, but okay. on the generally, it's the total weight of fish caught. Right. It's the usual one. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, and also on some of the big lakes, they uh, there's a gen genetically engineered type of rainbow trout called the golden trout, which is basically a rainbow trout, but it's gold, right? And they'll put, stock a few of those a few days before the big competitions. And if you catch one of those, you get a special prize. It's like a golden ticket. Yeah. <laughs> so it might be like you catch the golden trout and it's a 250 point prize or something like that there. Okay. That's quite nice for you. Yeah. So it's a, uh, yeah, so yeah, I don't do the competitions myself. I'm like, I'm more into it for, I just find it relaxing and I enjoy it and it's, you know, it chills you out mm -hmm. um, and you get into nature. But the, the people who are in the competitions, it's like amateur radio. I wanted the amateur radio thing a while back. The people who are into amateur radio contesting are take it really seriously. And it's the same for people who are in the fishing competitions. It's, it can take over their life. Yeah. I don't know if you can see um, Mark Christopher's questions on the chat. I did ask him. Oh. He's got three, three questions. Um, any well-established trophies? Oh, um, 
Um, you did hear my answer about there being competitions. Yeah, I'm assuming. We, in terms of well-established ones, uh, I don't know any off the top of my head. Like, they tend to be fairly local things apart from the national and international championships. Uh, in the UK, oh, there's one in the UK called Trout Masters, which is actually um, run by Trout Fisherman magazine, which isn't actually going anymore. That's been merged into Trout and Salmon magazine because magazines are dying a death, unfortunately, which I, I don't like because I like magazines. But uh, so that, that's actually run in a league format. So there's about 150 fisheries in the UK to take part. And if you catch a fish over the average size for that fishery, you can submit it to the Trout Masters competition. And they basically collate right. everyone's scores up nationally. So, uh, so it's a national competition that takes place over six months, the season. Because there was talking about seasons. Uh, yeah. Uh, generally, the season's March to September. Uh, the start and end dates depend on where you are. In Ireland, it's uh, the game season is the 1st of March to the 30th of September. My local river opens from the 17th of March to the 30th of September. Um, uh, the best time to fish, all isn't it? It's hard to say, really. It depends on the river. Uh, early season tends to be artificially easy because a lot of rivers and fisheries will stock their waters with fish from fish farms. And they're easy to catch. So you get a lot of people going out in the first day just catching these stocked fish. <laughs> um, the next best time would be mayfly season. So in the early May, late April, early May, the mayfly, hatch, uh, mayfly hatches begin. Uh, and it's a visual sight to see because you've just got these big insects flying everywhere. They're much bigger than other fly, uh, flies. And trout and salmon, no, not salmon, trout and sea trout and uh, other game fish just love them. And that's a big deal here, in, uh, particularly here in Ireland. There's actually a mayfly festival out in Mayo around Loch Corrib. Uh, so it's it's like a three-day festival of celebrating the mayfly and mayfly fishing. Um, and later season, things tend to quieten down uh, because basically all the good fish have been caught. <laughs> so you have to wait for the fish to spawn again or for them to be stopped. So mayfly season is probably the best natural highlight of the season. Uh, and second to that, op no, uh, when the season opens and you've got lots of fresh fish to catch. Um Oh, what's most? Oh, nice. Well, in Dublin, actually, there is where I like to fish um, on the River Dodder, which is goes for the city centre, but it's it looks totally natural. You wouldn't think it's going through the centre of Dublin. And there's a, a pub called the Dropping Well, which is on the banks of the river, and you can actually fish right outside it. So a lot of people would fish like literally 10, 20 foot from the pub, and there's a someone 15 years ago dumped a giant brass bull in the middle of the river. And you're talking about someone that weighs four or five tons and it appeared overnight. And they reckon the pub owners done it, did it. But yeah, you can fish around that bull. And when you're done for the day, you can go into the pub and uh, they'll you get food and drink. And there was a time they actually would, if you caught any fish and you wanted to eat them, they'd got them for you and prepare them. <laughs> but they don't do that anymore for health and safety reasons. But yeah, that's one of my favorite places. Second, will be Loch Corrib in Mayo, which is a fairly legendary trout lake, uh, very natural, uh, peaty water. Um, only thing is you need to fish it with people. It's uh, You can't really fish from the shore. It's too rocky. It's too dangerous. So you have to hire a boat and you need people to do that with. Um, in the UK, I, would, I loved fishing on the River Eden because that's Carlisle's my hometown. So I would fish on the River Eden uh, a lot of the time when I'm over there. Um, oh. I would also, I would love to go, in terms of salmon fishing, I wouldn't do it here, but what a lot of people do is go to Alaska or Siberia because it's cheaper just to fly out there and go fishing for salmon than it is to fish for salmon here. Mm. So like, you pay your, your 1,500 euro pounds uh, plane ticket to pay a couple of hundred for a hotel, and that's still cheaper than a week's fishing on one of the fancy rivers here. So I would like to go to Siberia or Alaska one day to fish. Uh, yeah. Favorite time of the year? Oh, uh, like I say, it's it depends on the river. Like mayflies favored by most people, or failing that uh, soon after the season opens. Am I, oh, I've asked this. 
Uh, yeah, and I've okay, mentioned this twice. Is yeah, that yeah, my place favorite is the the daughter in Dublin. But uh, I think he's I, yeah, generally it's uh, like um, I like for, for rivers and natural lakes over or reservoirs. Reservoirs don't really have any natural features; they're just big expanses of water, um, and there's not a lot to look at. <laughs> um, so that's why I know I prefer from natural over something artificial. Yeah, so um, yeah. I've got a, a couple of questions, uh, Robert. Yeah. Um, firstly, how the hell do you stock a river? Because um, logically, uh, <laughs> fish, fish would could just uh, be going away. Yeah, well, um, you, uh, yeah, they do, but most stay. And to get caught, and you have fish farms, and they've got big tanks, and they grow the fish and. And these tanks, mm. and they feed them artificial, not artificial, they feed them food pellets and the fish love them. And then they um, they use a, a literal water vacuum cleaner, which sucks the fish out of the water into mm. a tank on the back of a truck. And yes. the truck goes up to the edge of the water and there's a little ramp opens up and <laughs> the fish go flying down. And uh, yes, some uh, fish... some And, fish and they stay, stay in that river. That's quite impressive. The thing is, if brown trout won't go to the sea, they non migratory, So they'll stay mm -hmm. in that river system. Okay, right, yeah. Sea trout no, more, makes more sense. Yeah, sea trout you can't stock because they will swim away, but also sea trout are hard to breed in captivity. Um, so they generally don't. What they do with sea trout is they try hard to do stuff to the rivers to make them better for sea trout. So cleaning the water, mm. improving the flow so they get up to the spawning grounds easier. Uh, the River Dovey in Wales is a good example of that. You know, it's a sea trout river primarily, and they had major issues in the 90s with the decline of uh, sea trout stocks. <clears throat> so they basically, the people in charge spent a lot of money just basically clearing river banks, cleaning the water, putting in monitoring stations to monitor the quality of water and stuff like that. So that's how they recovered the stocks there. Uh, um, uh, but yes, uh, and uh, rainbow trout, is they're bred the same way as brown trout, and they literally just dump them into the lake and mm. rainbow trout um also oh yes i didn't tell you about triploids this is disturbing <laughs> uh, captive bred rainbow trout uh, have both uh, male and female organs but cannot breed mm. oh. no, i'm not surprised yeah so uh um and i don't actually like the taste of farmed rainbow fish it has a very um rainbow trout it's it has a very earthy taste it's it's not like it doesn't taste like fish <laughs> doesn't taste like trout or salmon it tastes almost like tuna but with a sort of uh, earthiness to it so but people people fish for it and they take it home and they eat it so uh, fair play to them you know, if they find it enjoyable but uh, like i say a natural you no know, natural brown trout is delicious especially smoked mm. you don't normally smoke trout but i do and it's lovely um uh uh yeah so it's uh, like salmon is delicious but i guess as I said, it's mm. and there's nowhere really around Dublin for salmon fishing anyway. It's all out in the west coast, uh, Galway, Mayo, down in Cork. So, um, yeah, what you got there? Uh, and then the uh, ne Sorry? next question is uh, how the hell do you fly fish the sea? Because you're just talking about fl fly fishing here in the sea and I live um, on the coast. I, uh, can't, I just can't imagine, you know, I, I, I've, I've never done fly fishing, but I can, I've seen it and. I understand how it works, but I can't understand how it works. It's more of a Caribbean thing. Coastal water. It's more of a Caribbean thing, really, um, mm. uh, where the water's clear and there's lots of shallow inlets. And mm -hmm. you'll catch, you can catch marlin, uh, bass, and various other fishes. And, and okay. uh, around Florida, where the water's clear, uh, the, Car no, the Caribbean and uh, parts of Latin America, it's, it's actually quite, pos uh, quite popular. Are they fishing from the shore or from the boat? Both. Oh, right. Mm. Or wading as well. You get them okay. just like normal fly fishing. You see people wading out. Um, now, you generally need <clears throat> to get specialist fly reels, so you can't use like your standards. Yeah. Uh, mm. Marlin. I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. You can't be pulling the line with your hands if you're catching a marlin. You'd lose your fingers, <laughs> wouldn't you? Yeah. So um, <laughs> you use heavier duty fly reels, and you might mm. actually not actually use a fly reel. You might use a multiplier reel and you'd wind the line off and then cast it and then wind in with a 
the multiplier. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's so it's not exactly the same as fly fishing in the UK, but it's the casting and the fly is still there. Uh, that stays the same. Yeah. Yeah, but the 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 techniques, the, the rod and the equipment might be upgraded. It's uh, there actually has been fly uh, fish caught on the fly off the coast of England. Um, it has happened uh, uh, around Devon and Cornwall, I believe, in a few places. There's very few places, and it's not happened all that often, but it's been done more as to prove a point that it could be done. Uh, people have caught fish there. And also um, around the Mediterranean and places like that. So generally it's where the water's clearer and shallower is where it works. And there's not much of that around the north, north of Western European coasts. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's, it's a, it's, it looks like regular fly mm. fishing, but with heavier duty tackle. And uh, yeah, it is, it's a thing. And I might want, that's one of those things I might try, like to try one day. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So we were, we were on holiday and yesterday we were walking by this very little river called the CERN. And as we kind of yomped past yakking away, we suddenly realized there was a guy fishing in the middle of the, this river. Yeah. Would he been course, he would have been course fishing was, it was very narrow. He's wearing, if he's wearing waders. Well, we didn't hang around because he gave he us was a dirty standing, look. <laughs> he was standing in the water. He wasn't on the bank. He was in the water. And then he would have been, very unlikely, he would have been course fishing. He'd been, wait, wait, he'd been fly fishing. He would have been fly fishing. He must have had or a... he might have been spinning. Right. He right. might have been like, uh, using a, a spinning rod, which is just a standard sort of overhead cast and let the line fly out. Yes, maybe. Um, maybe. So yeah. that, and that could be like a lure, such as a spinner or spoon or worm or maggot. Okay. But generally... Mm. Um, uh, course, you, I don't, I can't think of any kind of course fishing where they'd stand in the river. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, he was. Yeah. Just, yeah. Course fishing's more sedentary. It's kind of like you sit down and cast out and chill. Wait. As opposed okay. to fly fishing, where you have to stand up and move around. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's probably he's probably fishing for trout or salmon. It was. A, yeah. There's a. I guess it's chalk. I guess it's a chalk river because it's. Uh, oh yeah. What the base? Trout. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so yeah, you're probably game fishing. Yeah, okay. Most likely if you're brown. Game fishing, that's probably oh, yeah. yeah. Cool. Good. Well, I suspect we were very much within the 10 degree, <laughs> outside well, the 10 degrees of safety. Now, now we know <laughs> why he gave us the shit on. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, we that's probably why, yeah. We probably we funded it into, yeah, into view of everything that was in the river. Yeah, okay. Well, we didn't know he was there until the last moment. No. Well, that's I'm not sure it was. The river I fish, usually the daughter, I'm lucky because it's actually right next to a main road, one of the, the main arterial roads in Dublin. So it's, the, although once you're between the trees, it's fairly quiet, you still feel the vibrations from the cars, from the road that's 10, 20 metres away from you. So that means mm. the fish are accustomed to constant yeah, vibration and noise. Sort of so you, that's very lucky to have that. You no, know, it makes, you can be a bit more clumsy approaching them in the river. Okay. And also on the banks, it's also part of the river path passes through a, uh, a few public parks where you've got people constantly out walking their dogs and kids screaming and yeah, uh, stuff like that. So again, they get used to that. So they do get they do get accustomed to what no stuff and it's like mm -hmm. they're what freaks them out is something that isn't normal to them. Mm. So if if there's a lot of vibration, banging, screaming, shouting, and that's normal to them, they won't get bothered if it's close to them. Uh, what else can I think of? Yeah, Frank pretty much covered the basics. Like there's yeah, that's, hundreds yeah. of books on the mm. subject, and yeah. people take it very serious. And you, there's a lot of this is the way it must be done. People know it's like mm. hey, I fish this way and I do this, and no, no, that's wrong. You should be doing this. Way. But this way works for me. No, it doesn't. Well, I've caught fish in it. No, no, that was luck. You do it my way. No, you get a lot of that, <laughs> and um, you just have to learn to do it your own way and do what works for you. Mm. And, What's um, the largest fish you've ever caught? A seven pound brown trout is my, uh, and I caught that in Loch Corrib. The biggest fish overall was a 13 pound rainbow, but that's a rainbow. So it was stocked. Yeah, it's no like a lot of people <laughs> a bit disparaging about rainbow trout. <laughs> so because they are like kind of, you know, in They're Europe, throwing themselves onto your rod, throwing themselves onto your fly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh no! I've, I mean, I I've actually caught hooked rainbow trout. No, I, I take the line off my rod, so I, I pull it out maybe a couple of meters at a time, and then 
know, you, you're stripping a line out and I just, you just flick it forward so it's not in the way. So you're not doing a proper cast. You're just casting it out two or three meters just so you can pull more line out. So you pull back to pull out more line. And then that first cast, I've had fish, rainbow trout take the fly. I mean, they are so easy to catch. It's crazy. And like the the, res the, the big reservoirs, Graff and Rutland and all, realistically, you're not fishing. You're basically going in to buy a load of fish, but in a mm. really roundabout way. Um, <laughs> the fact that, no, for 29 pounds, you get to take home eight fish. Yes. Yeah, that's... Um, no, mm. Kind of says that there's clearly, this is easy. Um, and, and most people would hit that. It's only if the weather's particularly bad or hot or cold or there's uh, something else spooking the fish that you wouldn't catch that many, no, that you wouldn't uh, catch that many fish. Also, I forgot to mention, the reservoirs generally don't have a close season. So unlike for rivers and natural lakes, which go March to September, the big reservoirs stay open year round for rainbow trout. So that's one of the things, the only reason I would really go for, for rainbow trout fishing is close season. And if I'm bored fishing for pike or fishing off the pier in Dunleary, I might be tempted to go to one of the rainbow trout fisheries around here. Um, but yeah, it's, they stay open year round. So, um, and they're, they're a moneymaker for the water companies, apparently. So that's why they do it. Yeah. Talk, I just want to congratulate you on your backdrop there. Oh, yes. Mm. Yes, I thought that was a fairly top. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I fish, anyway. <laughs> Dynamite, I thought you just, yes. just Shot, it. Shotgun in the barrel. <laughs> I had my net sitting behind it beside the computer because my son was using it for something. But I've got this nice little gadget here, which I attach this to my fishing vest on the back. Yeah. So when I want it, I just pull it apart and it's magnetic. No, so right. my fish. And then I just slip it up my back and it reconnects oh, like that there. So there's a nice little doohickey. And that's a fairly small net, but that's perfect for fishing the daughter. Okay. Uh, you wouldn't get fish bigger than that. Mm. Uh, so how many flies do you have to how many flies do you have to tie for a season or a fish? Um, I personally would tie about a hundred and then before the season starts. And then tie another 10 or 20 before I go out, uh, each time I go out. Um, so in a season, I might tie two to 300. Wow. I like okay. to get out fishing more than I do. They get I used up then, do they? I mean... Uh, you generally lose them to bushes. That's where, right. that's where they end up. <laughs> um, occasionally, they might disintegrate with general, but that's very rare because you, you set them with varnish. So when you tie the head, you do a thing called a whip finish where you sort of tie up the head with thread and then you drop a load of varnish on it. Just, you know, to solidify it, but yeah, most flies go to um, trees, and bushes, and stuff like that. And they do the, the 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 stuff they're made of from does actually rust and biodegrade and rust down to nothing. Mm -hmm. So in a year or two, when they're exposed to the, uh, no, the open air, so they're not terribly bad for the environment. Um, but yeah, it's that's where they usually end up. Or after catching a fish, the fish has mashed it up. That's not yeah. mm -hmm. where you'd lose it. But yeah, so yeah, two to three hundred in the average year. Mm -hmm. And there's there's like buying flies is uh, you have to work up work out the value, you know, uh, is it better to tie or buy? Uh you go to a tackle shop, they'll charge anything from one well here in Ireland, one euro fifty up to five euros for a fly. And typically trout flies are about one fifty. Uh if you want to go out fishing for a day, you probably should take about twenty. That'll get you through a day over a couple of different you know, styles and for that particular river. Uh, so you can see how you know, the price yeah, mounts up. up, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Whereas mm. tying, you can buy, you get a, a hundred, well, 75 euros will get you a really good kit, um, which should get you a couple of hundred, fly, a couple of hundred flies. Uh, and then you'd have to just replace materials as you go along. And mm. the materials, like I say, can be bought from a year or upwards, you know, depending on the quality. I don't really go out of my way to buy fancy quality stuff you know, the bottom yeah. moral stuff does for me and I've never had an issue with it um, so if you're really into it and you fish a lot it's all it's better to tie your own flies yeah I can um, see. and there's also a lot of us in Dublin we'd, we'd have fly exchanges so if we're short flies and we don't have time you sort of like basically you, there's a, a Facebook group where we say we need some flies and someone will give you the flies and in return 
Yoga flies back to them at a later point. So mm. they have these exchanges. Um, so and also some people are really good at tying particular types of flies, and some people can't do it for love nor money. But they <laughs> might be better at a different type of fly. Yeah. Uh, that tends to be the smaller ones where uh you no know, good eyesight. Uh, also uh, clumsy hands also plays into it. Mm. You know, big thick hands doesn't help. Mm. So a lot of people would so they put people would produce the small flies for the people who can't produce them and vice versa. I know uh, people who can do the bigger flies or would give them flies in return. Um, yeah, so it's, um, yeah, so it's, it's just a case of weighing up you know, what's worth it for you. If you fish two or three times a year, buy your flies. Yeah. Going out every week, make them. Yeah. Um, unless you've got money, just go waste. Um, 